so so what what, what I just did entirely from memory was to alter the basic program so it now prints out hello in basic it then assembles some ARM machine code with the immediate value of 42 into R0 call the supervisor call to the operating system Y0 which prints a character on the screen and then returns to basic and that star on the screen there was, was done by that piece of ARM machine code um, written by this piece of basic so this is a pretty uh, um, uh, early ARM processor machine, right? It's not that early. This is a RISC PC, so this is 1992 or 3. Um, the early ones are very, very much earlier. So we, we designed ARM starting in 1983 and had ARMs in our hand from 1985. Um, we built machines for our own development purposes with those ARMs in them um, and sold some of them, one of which we'll see in a little while, which is the ARM second processor to a BBC computer. Um, and we started selling ARM-powered computers uh, for real in 1986 as second processors, and then standalone machines in 1987, many of which are available here for being looked at. So, uh, so, so who are you? So, I'm Sophie Wilson. I designed the ARM instruction set so you, did you invent ARM? Is that okay to say like this? Um, there, there were two of us doing this work in a major way. So after the BBC computer, Acorn's first really major success, not our first actual success, since the Acorn Atom and the Acorn System range were strong successes enough for us to be able to start a company and keep going, um, we we were looking around for a processor to replace the 6502, which was in the BBC computer, and there wasn't what we wanted. In the BBC computer, we built a four mega transfer per second memory system, and we gave half of that to the processor and half to the video system. Um, so we're quite capable of designing memory systems um, with high performance. And we sort of wanted a processor to use that performance and couldn't find one. Um, we built a lot of uh, machines, buying people's merchant microprocessors um, that were available at the time and building BBC second processors because that was quite easy. So we built one with a 4 megahertz 6502, um, an 8286, uh, 68,000 uh, national semiconductors, 32016, and all of these things have various claims by their manufacturers um, to be the latest, greatest chip, far better than anybody else's chip, uh, and none of them lived up to it. In fact, uh, we were able to formulate a, a rule for these machines, which is um, the instruction set and the claims didn't matter what mattered was how fast they fetched instructions from main memory. So if you fetched instructions from main memory at four megabytes per second, you performed the same as another machine with a different architecture that fetched instructions from main memory at four megabytes per second. So the four megahertz 6502 fetched instructions at four megabytes per second, and an eight megahertz 32016 used up um, four cycles for bus transfer and thus did only two mega bus transfers per second, uh, but it did fetch 16 bits. So it also came out to be doing four megabytes a second, and so on. Throughout all these processes, that number characterized it. Well, that was a crying shame, because the machines with fast clocks used up many clock cycles for a bus cycle, and the machines with efficient bus cycles didn't go very fast. And what we wanted was a machine that efficiently interfaced to memory, um, preferably very wide, and went quite quickly. And there wasn't one. And f for a time, we flailed around, you know, ju just saying things like humbug and bar. And so, um, 
uh, what's it called? Uh, um, uh, is it a lot about memory bandwidth that ARM was uh, kind of like uh, invented because there was a problem with using the memory bandwidth or something like that? N no, that, that's, that's sort of backwards. Um, we wanted to use memory bandwidth and we wanted to build certain types of machine and we couldn't do it with what was available. So two things happened to get us out of that. So the first thing um, was there was going to be a successor to the 6502. So Acorn, like Apple, used the 6502 as its central processor at the time. And we were naturally extremely interested when the original designers, Western Design Center of the 6502, um, announced that they were building a successor. So we got an airplane and flew out to Phoenix to see them. Who were those people making that, that stuff? Western Design Center. Western De Design Center. Yes. Western Design Center were a small design house. They sold the microprocessor design on to companies who actually made it. So it was made variously by MOS technology that was part of Commodore and uh, Rockwell and a company called Cinetech and several other people. So Western Design Center were the originators of the, the processor itself. Was it a CISC? That was a, not it's, a risk? It's uh, insane to characterize the 6502 as any type of processor. Um, if anything, you know, with, with, with a very low number of instructions of very small type, uh, it's difficult to think about it. Um, yet, yet at the same time, you know, it's, not, it's clearly not very complex, but it's also not a risk. Um, so anyway, we flew out to see them. Now, we'd been out to see companies that built microprocessors before. For example, we'd been to see National, um, who were the designers of the NS32016. That's definitely a CISC. Um, and that was being designed at various places in the world. We went to see them in Israel. And it was what you would expect. A large industrial unit, um, chock full of engineers working away on it. They were having a lot of difficulty. You know, Acorn was trying to build um, things using the NS32016. Uh, they didn't have anything that worked until Rev-D, Rev-H, uh, was, was the first one that was sort of vaguely usable and uh, it still wasn't suitable for production. So they were making lots of mistakes. So anyway, we, we flew off to see Western Design Center and navigated to the address they'd supplied and we discovered two bungalows on the outskirts of Phoenix um, staffed by some senior design engineers and a bunch of um, university kids. <laughs> Um, and they were designing a microprocessor um, without a large amount of automation, big, big drawing boards on which they stuck sticky tape. Um, we came away fairly convinced that if those guys were capable of designing a processor, anybody could. So the other thing that happened roughly in parallel with that was the very first papers on uh, teams using the risk paradigm uh, had surfaced, and Andy Hopper, now uh, head of the Cambridge University Computing Laboratory, uh, who was at the time a director of ACORN, had put some of those papers on my desk, thinking I might be interested to see them. Um, so we had it, it, in our hand uh, some pieces of paper showing other people's risk designs. W which year was that? This would be 1983. 83? So you had some papers about risk, <coughs> and then what happened then? So it's important to remember what risk is. The acronym isn't quite correct in that everybody translates it as reduced instruction set computer. Um, but what, what it actually is is reduced instruction set complexity computer. So w what's been reduced is the complexity of instructions. You don't have um, instructions that are sort of arcane combinations of things. Um, you simplify that, and you simplify it down to the point where, in Stanford University's case, a small number of uh, 
postgraduates and professors can build one, ditto at Berkeley, and at IBM a small team can produce a microprocessor. So there was a paradigm that seemed to be superior. So we started thinking, how would you build something? So we played fantasy instruction sets for a while and selected an instruction set. And all of that is just thinking. Fantasy uh, instruction set, what is that? You select instructions. What, what, what would you like your instruction set to look like? I mean, if I've put some instructions on the screen, um, I had to want it to look like this, that, um, that there be an instruction that put an immediate value into a register or that moved another register to the program counter. Um, so do you design instruction set or do, do you choose them? You, you choose them. It, it's, it's a choice. Um, so in ARM, I made all those choices and with Steve Ferber, we worked out a way to make it all work. And there are some things that I wanted in the instruction set that he couldn't see a way to making things work. And they got left out of the instruction set. I mean, nowadays, both of us are much more competent at designing processes and we could have left those in. But at the time, we, we had some guiding principles in the project and one of them was keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yes. So what did you leave out in the beginning? And you, was it taken back in later? No. Things that were left out in the beginning set the pattern for how the machine would be. So that, that's, a, that's design of ARM and it stays like that? Yeah. Since then? So right now there's like billions and billions of ARM devices. So how many of them are very similar to what you did back then? So, so far ARM have shipped about 50 billion powered ARM chips. So all of them are based on the same, what you did back then? Um, uh, there, there are now about a billion or so that are the very modern ARM instruction set, the thing called ARM V8. I didn't design that. But most of them execute the classic ARM instruction set, um, which I designed the original one of. Um, the majority seller of ARMs is the ARM 7 TDMI. And that essentially runs that instruction set um, and a compact instruction set that was designed in the early 90s. That's pretty awesome, no? Um, what, what, uh, how do you feel about the... Uh, uh, was, it, uh, was it a little bit uh, by chance that it happened? Was how do you that? describe it? So the team at Acorn, me, Steve Ferber, had rather got used to being able to do everything that we set our minds to. So you must remember that we'd worked together for quite a while building stuff. Um, building a microprocessor is essentially building some complex digital logic and we knew how to do that. If you look inside a BBC computer um, or similar, we're used to building large amounts of complicated digital logic and that's what a microprocessor is. Um, similarly, we're used to programming stuff you know, the operating system for a, a machine or the basic interpreter I'd have written. And that's a, a lot of work, but we're used to that too. So you, you were making the Acorn machines, right? Yes. You were, you were making the software, everything, or what were you doing? I, I was doing everything. Uh, I, I, were you the CTO? I, I, no. No? Uh, I, eventually, I... Be, at Acorn, I became the system design manager. Um, but it's fairly well known now that I wrote the basic interpreter by myself um, and designed many of the concepts be behind the machines. So, for example, the operating system of a BBC computer was programmed by Paul Bond and John Thackeray, but to my design. Um, I said it had to do all of these things, and they went off and did it while I wrote the basic interpreter. The machine, uh, the BBC computer, is essentially Steve Ferber's and my co-design as implemented by the engineers at Acorn, Chris Turner being the chief engineer leading them. Um, so, th I mean, these machines are huge amounts of collaborative work. Um, if, if you see a painting by a grandmaster, you know pretty much the grandmaster and maybe some of his helpers did the work on that, but they it took them a long time. 
engineering isn't like that. It's a team sport, large teams of people um, following one vision to build something. But see, and the vision is obviously refined by everybody in the team to make things better. But something happened in 1983. There was, uh, the papers arrived, and then from that point until... Well, how, how, did we just working in an office every day? What were you doing? How, how did you get to that point and to a real chip that came a little bit later, two years later? Or? Um, so we designed the instruction set. I designed the instruction set and talked Steve into it. He designed the microarchitecture of the microprocessor. So the microarchitecture is the thing below. The, the architecture is the instruction set. So we often say ISA, instruction set architecture. Microarchitecture is the hardware realization of an engine that can do those instructions. So Steve designed the microarchitecture in parallel with the architecture. To prove that he designed the microarchitecture correctly, he wrote um, in BBC Basic a model of the microarchitecture. To prove that I designed the architecture correctly, I wrote an interpreter for the processor's instruction set and wrote programs in it. So well before any actual commitment to doing things, we could demonstrate that you could write sensible programs in this stuff. The programs did what I claimed. Steve's microarchitecture did what he claimed. Um, you can then do all the verification that you need to do. So on my models of the processor, you write programs um, that are expected to produce particular results, those models run quite quickly. I mean, on a 6502 second processor, we could run an ARM emulator at hundreds of thousands of instructions per second, where the microarchitecture model and later on the transistor model of the processor uh, ran very much more slowly than that. Um, but we built a test suite that demonstrated the processor was the processor ran it on my models of the processor and then on Steve's models of the processor um, to prove that his model did the same as mine. And then when we had a, a, a transistor model of the processor, we ran it on that too, and then we made one. And to, to nobody's great surprise, really, the processor arrived back in April 1985. We plugged it into the development board, and it worked. No surprise. Uh, we had got rather used to building stuff that worked. Um, we didn't, well, we had an idea that we'd done something slightly exceptional um, because you know, we had the evidence of National Semiconductor not getting the NS32016 quite right for quite a long time. Um, but th that it would be a pro product worthy chip, um, we didn't quite suspect at the time. And so basically it was emulation a little bit when you were testing? Is it kind of like emulation when you do it? Uh, uh, you said you were doing BBC uh, testing of the system before you actually made the chip. Is it similar to what they do now? Um, emulation is a specific thing. Emulation, you have the detailed RTL model of the processor written in a hardware description language like VHDL or Verilog, and you run that on a machine that emulates the effect of all of that. So you, it, you have all your RTL, you, you put it through a silicon compiler or synthesizer um, and run it on an emulator. So we didn't do any of that. Um, emulators didn't exist. Emulators came after FPGAs were designed. So there weren't any emulators. Um, what we had were simulators. Um, so Steve's model of the processor in BBC Basic, um, he also wrote the simulator in there as well. So to, to model a processor which has clock edges and events of latch data moving, um, Steve, Steve's model of the processor is modeled in um, a clocked event stimulator, a, a thing that has a regular clock and calls everything. Um, so so he, he'd built a simulator as well as the model of the processor in there. Um, when we built ARM, it was built in transistors and extracted on transistor models, and we ran the transistors to make sure that the processor functioned correctly. So there weren't, there weren't any other tools other than those we wrote ourselves and 
the transistor model of the processor and, and spice models and so on to check that the transistors worked properly. So maybe we can... Because uh, this is a long time ago. Long time ago. <coughs> you can see some of the Acorn machines that were... Uh, let's go and check them out.